All in all, May was a bad month for the market. S&P 500 was down north of 6%. The Nasdaq was down just about 8%. And where we got hurt the most was with the semiconductors index. Semiconductors in May alone were down north of 17%. I wanted to talk about the semiconductors for a little bit because we do have some investments in that space. Intel and Qualcomm is one of them. In general, when the year started, the semiconductor guys, in my view, had too much of an optimistic view of the market. That's number one. That set up the stage for what followed in May. The second thing, they don't really have an understanding of the end consumer. They only sell semiconductors, so they don't have really good visibility. And that was another problem with their business model. The third thing that happened is increase in tariffs on $200 billion of Chinese exports. Another thing that happened was the blacklisting of uh, Huawei because after all, 29% of their wireless infrastructure goes to most of the companies operating in that space. Their market share is 29%. And when they are blacklisted and you can't sell to them, that causes a problem. 14% of their market share is in the wireless devices and that cannot help semiconductors as well. Also companies such as Texas Instruments, Intel and Nvidia all started reporting some disappointing numbers for the future. Texas Instruments was talking about very choppy markets and normally when these down markets in that space start happening it can last anywhere between four to five months. And the last thing that happened that was notable eight gigabyte memory chips are down in pricing about 40%. And we have a tremendous oversupply in that space. And that brings me to a space that I wanted to talk about, and that is the software subscription space. Companies in that space normally tend to perform better. I wanted to zero in on one company that has a lot of barriers to entry, that regardless how markets do and industries do, that particular company can still continue performing, and that company is PayPal. The bad news about PayPal, if there is such thing, is that they sell a little bit expensively at about 30 times earnings. The market sales on average right now is 17 times earnings, so they are not cheap. However, this is a company that can still continue growing their business at about 20% per year. This is a company that has a lot of barriers to entry because at this point they are accepted by 22 million merchants. They are used by 277 million users. 80% of the biggest 500 internet companies use them. Their digital wallet is so easy to use because customers that shop online do not need every time they go and shop and are about to pay to re-enter their personal information. They are used seven times more than the Amazon checkout point of purchase. Normally these companies charge about 15 basis points for every transaction made. And normally companies that issue the cards, such as Visa and MasterCard, charge about one and a half percent. So about 98% of every transaction goes to the merchants. Some people might say that cryptocurrencies might be their competitor. In my view, their number one competitor is cash.com. Cash that is still used in most of the world is their number one competitor. Cryptocurrency has no recourse in case of fraud. You can go back and reverse a transaction. And also it's pretty slow. About seven transactions are done per second, as opposed to 65,000 transactions per second with any of the card members, including PayPal. 12% of all e-commerce and retail transactions are done online. In other words, there is still a lot of tremendous growth left for these companies, such as PayPal in the pipeline. Also, there are new business opportunities for a company like PayPal, such as B2B. $120 trillion of transactions are done between business to business, and this is an untapped market completely for each one of the card companies, Visa and MasterCard, and also PayPal. A big day today in a big week. Uh, of course, I'll be focusing on Apple and their WWDC event, WWDC 2019, or the Worldwide Developer Conference. This is a big event because it is Apple's software event. We know that in the fall is when Apple announces their hardware, but the Worldwide Developer Conference is so that the vast population of developers learn about the software development kits or SDKs and the new features that are added to those, as well as the new capabilities announced in their APIs or application program interfaces. So the four main categories that 
Apple will be announcing in is uh, iOS 13, and then the betas are released after that as well. Mac OS 10.15, and then Watch OS 6, and they may even announce some new hardware. For iOS 13, Find My is a new app that they're going to be including. Find My is a combination of the Find My Phone and Find My Friends combined into one app. Mm. Dark Mode, which gives you the ability to look at your phone in dark settings or in different lights so that, you're, say, if you're in a movie theater, it doesn't blind everyone. The iPad specifically of the iOS 13 software uh, is expected to support multiple windows, and this is something that I think Steve Jobs envisioned back in the day is, is moving iOS and integrating it with the Mac OS and having the iPad more like a desktop uh, type device. There'll be a whole newly designed home screen for the iPad, so Apple's really doubling down uh, with the software for the iPad. A couple of the new apps on there are a whole new reminders update, health, as well as screen time. Apple is committed to focusing on people not spending all their time and, and letting people know where they're spending their time in the operating system, on the iPads, in iOS, and it lets them know if they're overspending time, they can set limits. Mac OS 10.15 focuses on uh, Marzipan, which is the application to port iPad apps to the Mac. So the Mac apps have been neglected for quite a while and this technology allows you to easily port iPad apps onto the Mac. There'll be a whole brand new music app. The music infrastructure for Apple is hugely profitable, especially as they compete against Spotify. External window. So this allows you to use other devices as an external window. You can use your Mac and then have your iPad sitting there and you could drag things onto that external device through the cloud. Extended Apple Watch authentication, so your Apple Watch actually authenticates you on your Mac. Uh, new watch faces, and then an on-watch app store. So you don't have to go actually to your phone anymore, you can go onto your watch and download apps from there. And then lastly, for the new hardware, there could be an announcement of the Mac Pro. Mac Pro is Apple's uh, most hardware elite configuration, so this is for image rendering very processor intensive and so it, it has that capabilities and then even an external display. In conclusion, a very big day about where the future of Apple is going in terms of software but this also gives us an indication about where they may release in terms of hardware later on in the fall. So as we uh, alluded to earlier, uh, there's a lot of activity with the uh, yield curve uh, within the last week. The 10-year uh, Treasury is actually at its lowest level since uh, September of 2017, about 20 month uh, low that it's hit. The uh, two year to the three year remains inverted, still at about six basis points. As we mentioned last week, the three month had inverted with the 10 year. The one year has inverted with the 10 year by about seven basis points. Uh, the two year to the 10 year has not inverted, but that gap that was consistently remaining anywhere from 19 to 22 basis points is down to about 16. Uh, basis points. So there is some narrowing there and it tells you uh, how quickly things can change. When I think it was two weeks ago, we were talking about the nice upslope that we had between the uh, two year to the 10 year and even including the 30 years. A couple of articles I looked at over the weekend talking about whether or not the Federal Reserve might change their uh, position and possibly cut rates. And I'm seeing uh, arguments both ways. So uh, until we get some kind of a decision on the Fed on what they're going to do with these short term rates, I mean, we should expect the volatility to continue. Hello, everybody, and thank you again for watching our videos. I'm Amit Stavinsky, the Managing Director of Tamar Securities and its affiliates, 911 Financial Services and Firefighters United. If you like the video, please sign up to our YouTube channel. You can also call us directly to our main offices in Woodland Hills, California at 818-914-7461. The highlight of the week is that during times where sectors such as the semiconductor sector are down substantially, it's time to look at companies that operate mostly on a subscription model that collect revenues day in and day out regardless of what happens in the marketplace.